guys. Welcome to week 10. You can almost see the finish line. Just almost see the finish line. We're almost there. Um, today we're going to pick up basically where we left off last week. Um, specifically talk, talking about SQL, more SQL, but this is the pulling the records side of it, which is, like I said last week, this is where the meat and potatoes of SQL is. Um, creating the structures and all that is fun and all, but there's a lot more to SQL when it comes to retrieving data. For those of you that are curious, because I'm going to be using a database specific in this uh, lecture, for those of you that want to go grab it, it's in actually in week nine. It's an SQL file called order sample. Um, or at least if you want to rewatch this lecture and try what I'm doing with the same data set, you can grab it. You just download the file, open it in MySQL Workbench and run it. It'll create the database and restore the data and everything I'm using today. So it's pretty much exactly what I'll be using. Okay, so today I'm going to be focusing on the basics of the select statement. And the select statement is made up of many, many pieces. However, the common three are select from and where. Something cool about the select statement is it almost reads like an English sentence or an English paragraph, depending on how long this SQL statement gets. It is fairly understandable, even from a non-technical point of view. You can usually explain what it's doing to someone who's not technical. Um, so, although select from and where is what we're going to focus on today, the entirety of the select statement actually has six pieces. So, select from and where is the first three pieces that are the most common. Select allows you to choose what you're going to retrieve. From chooses where you're pulling it from. Where is where you filter out what you're actually pulling. And then you've got Three more pieces after that, which is group by having an order by. That comes later. That's for when we want to use functions to summarize data, like counting records or min, max, averages, that kind of stuff. Uh, order by allows you to sort. So the first, the bottom three are all optional, depending on what you're doing. Um, the where clause technically is optional too. Um, but realistically, you tend to not want to exclude that very often. And this is where there's an important word that on this slide that a lot of people, when they get to the final exam, the number of times I've had students, both in my sections and other sections, raise their hand saying, what does this word mean? The specific word I'm talking about is predicate. Predicate is a conditional Boolean operator. In, you guys have covered the if statement in Java, right? By now? Yeah. You know what's inside the Parentheses, that's a predicate. If I greater than six, that's a predicate. At least that's what it is in SQL. It's a piece of Boolean math. It's an expression that eval evaluates to either true or false. So just remember the word predicate. So when you see the exam, you'll see you'll go, Dan talked about this word. That just means it's basically a conditional statement, just like an if statement in Java. And this is just, you know, if you're reading a syntax-based thing, it's the exact same idea here. So the field list, so the select statement, you have two choices. You can use the asterisk, which means include all available columns, or the comma-defined list. So you have a list of fields separated with a comma. So you can, instead of pulling the entire table, you want to pull just a few columns. and I'm going to explain why select star is only used in development. Select, uh, well, we say select star, it's select asterisk, but we tend to say select star, is only used in development because in production, select star can be very, very expensive. So let's just say we have a single row of data. It's, I don't know, 50K of data. People say, yeah, 50K is not that much. Let me pull up a calculator real quick. So we got 50K, one row. 
and we do a select star from whatever table and it just so happens that we forgot to include the where statement to reduce what it is and the row has 10 million rows. Hang on, let's divide that by 1024 one more time. 476 megabytes of data being retrieved by single command. Now, I know some of you are probably thinking, yeah, 406, uh, 476 megabytes is not that big. Call of Duty Modern, Modern Warfare 2, 76 gigs. That's 500 megs. Now there's 100 of you asking for that same amount of data at the same time. And that is a low usage environment. In a high usage environment, it could be thousands of requests at a, as per minute or more. Uh, I know one of our servers at work fields about 10,000 queries a second. Not a minute, a second. Suddenly you're moving these huge chunks of data back and forth all over the internet. Or actually even between servers. And not everybody has an Amazon data center to, you know, with massive 25 gigabit connections between the servers. Realistically, you might, if you're lucky, your rack has a 10 gig connection. So every time you ask for this data, it takes up a chunk of data, space, amount of time, amount of data bandwidth. And when you, for example, I like using a sink for an example. So you've got your sink full of water. You pull a plug. The second you pull that plug, does the water disappear instantly? No, it takes a while, right, to go down the drain. Same thing with computers. When one server's serving up a lot of data to another server, the pipe's only so big. That means the more you try to jam through it, the slower everything gets. So we tend to try to avoid that. So on the other hand, if we did select ID and name, ID is an integer, so that's probably eight bytes. A name, 100, K, 100 bytes for the name. So let's say each query is point zero one K times back to our 10 millions. So we went from 480 megabytes to 900 K roughly. Because instead of asking for the whole row, we were very selective in what we asked for. Therefore, 900K, as far as a database server is concerned, is nothing. As far as a network is concerned, it's nothing. I mean, I've one of our applications, the JavaScript library is bigger than 900K, just to, you know, put pretty pictures on the, on the page. You have to be selective. Therefore, select star is great when you're for learning. It's great when you're exploring the database because you may not know what the structure of the database is because you might not always get a diagram. So you've got to figure out what's in there. Select star will show you what's in there, what kind of data there is. You don't want to do that in production. So when you're actually writing a real application, you want to go, you want to select the fields. All right, so that's an important life lesson for database design, uh, database work. Um, a lot of people just go, ah, oh, select star from this because I don't know if I'm going to need column A, B, or C, so I might as well grab them all. And then suddenly, the next thing you know, you're pulling back gigabytes of data and you wonder why your, your server's screaming in pain in the server room. So if you do a select star in MySQL, example, select star from customers, it'll look like this. And I'm actually going to go to MySQL to show it to you instead. Why is my font small? I held down the control key and scrolled my mouse. That works in a lot of editors. It works in Word. And it works on a web page. It's just Windows shortcut for Zoom. So there's select star from customers. And if you look at this, it's exactly what's on that slide because I built the slides on this sample database. So that pulls everything. Um, this returned 500 rows, fantastic. On the other hand, if I want to return just the ID and the name, and I'm being dumb because it's customer ID. You okay there? 
Is your computer okay? Um, you will notice that it ran in the same amount of time. Even though I'm retrieving a lot less data. Why? Because it's running on the same machine. There's no network involved. There's just memory. Realistically, this retrieves a, a lot less data than the select star. But, you know, when you're talking about a small data set, you'll never notice the difference. It's when you start talking about real data sets. So that's the difference between doing a select star and the common delimited list. And that's, you know, the same thing here, except this case I use name and city. Um, oh, something else that's kind of cool. You can specify the order of the columns, the way they get returned. So if I go name city, name first, city second. But if I turn around and go city name, you can control what order the columns come back in. Now, for something like this, it's really handy when you're programming and you're actually dealing with the database in whatever language, whether it's Python, Java, PHP, whatever, that's not as important because it everything gets returned to something like basically it's an array. Uh, you'll learn about those later in your programming class, but basically it comes back as a key value pair. And it really does make a difference what order the columns are in for that. But when you're running it like this, it's kind of handy, especially if you've got a lot of columns and there's certain things you want to focus on. So this is just showing that the column order really doesn't mean anything. You can set it yourself. So the from clause is listing specifically from what table certain rows are being returned from. So in this case, we want to pull everything from customers. And on the slide deck, you will notice that there's a magic keyword that was included in here. And the keyword is called distinct. Now, distinct is modifying the results. And distinct, we talk about it at this point because it has to do with the select portion of the query. Distinct says, give me all the unique combinations of columns as a whole. So if I take, so right now I have 500 rows in my database. It's not limiting it. So it returns 500 because I created it with 500 records to have an easy number to work with. Distinct operates on the combined columns. So if I run distinct, it still returns 500 because, well, there's just, that many in here. But if I take off the dis the city, I think that one returns that. But if I go distinct city, there we go. You will notice down here, which, you know, for those of you at the back of the room, it's unfortunate you can't read this. This says 276 instead of 500 rows. What distinct does, it operates on the entire row of data. So in this case, I'm only retrieving one value. So cool. It's giving me all the unique values it sees as each row. So if I were going to go, um, what else is in the customer's table that I could use as an example? Uh, let's go city, comma, region, 283. So what's happening is it looks at the entire row and it says, okay, we have an Athens, Georgia in our list. Great. We have Des Moines, Iowa, great. We have an Overland Park, Kansas, great. If it sees Overland Park, Kansas a second time, it says, we already have this in the list. We don't need it. So it only grabs the unique, the, the, it returns just the unique versions of the row, com, the column combinations that you're pulling back. Um, it's really handy when you're counting rows so that you don't uh, return invalid data. Now, that being said, if you do a select distinct and you include the primary key, you will get everything. Why? <laughs> is always It's always distinct. Therefore, the second you add the primary key into the mix, regardless, the whole thing 
and it's not ID, it's customer ID. So then I get my 500 rows because the primary key is making each row unique. Therefore, each row is distinct. That's what distinct does. It's well worth playing. Like I set up this database so that you, if you guys want to play with what I'm showing during the lecture, you can practice these things and see what the behavior is without having to worry about real super complicated or com or super big data sets. It'll demonstrate pretty much everybody's every day today's concepts. Um, the last one is a special SQL keyword. Um, what it does, which is kind of cool, um, is it limits how many rows are being returned. We usually don't include it when we talk about the select from where, order by, whatever, because realistically, you it's not part of this basic way of retrieving rows. It allows you to limit what's coming back. And by limit, I don't mean limit by filtering. It's literally limiting by number of rows. So if I said, it gives me five. It gives me the first five it finds if, because I'm not sorting anything yet. So it returns the first five. So limit five says, give me five rows. Limit is really cool because you can exploit the living crap out of your database with it. There's all kinds of nifty tricks that you can do using limit. And I will show you guys some of these, especially once we start talking aggregate functions and stuff, what you can do with limit. Limit has some really interesting use cases, uh, especially if you want to limit how much programming code you have to have in your application. Um, for example, imagine you were writing this in Java and you retrieve this original query, which has 500 rows, but you actually only want the first five. So it returns to you a list. Then you're going to do a loop, one, two, three, four, five, and then exit your loop. Why the heck did you retrieve 500 rows if all you needed was five? Therefore, maybe you don't even need a loop if you know you're going to pull five. So there's, you know, you can use, you can leverage the database to make your actual application code simpler by letting the database do what it's good at. Don't make the database do, like, don't do the work the database can do for you, is what I'm trying to say. Now, we're going to talk about the where clause. And I'm going to show you guys a few cool examples. And then we're actually going to talk about order by also. And I'll show you guys a few examples of order by with the limit and that kind of stuff. But the where clause is where most of the interesting challenges of SQL come in when you're first starting out. So the where clause is a series of Boolean expressions. What's another word for the Boolean expressions? Starts with the P. I mentioned it. There we go. One person was listening. Two people because she smirked. So there's at least two people over here that were listening. Yes. Series of Boolean expressions, also known as predicates. Um, there's tons of operators. You can have multiple clauses. You can have, you know how in an if statement in Java, you can have if this or that, or if this and that, and then you can throw in parentheses and then you go this and this, but, or that you can make your if statement really complicated. You can do the same thing in this, except it's written very English. Uh, you'll see in a minute. And somebody put in the word bracket. It's actually supposed to be parentheses, not brackets. Brackets are square. So. We're going to start out with pulling out um, the regular string. So be aware that the universal standard for identifying a string, a literal string, what they call a literal string, to SQL is single quotes. MySQL is special because it lets you use single quotes or double quotes. Postgres, Oracle, um, Teradata, they use single quotes. Double quotes have a different meaning. Uh, Microsoft SQL Server, I really don't know. I haven't worked with it in so long that I couldn't tell you what it does off the top of my head. But if you use single quotes, you know it's going to work everywhere. So I'm going to literally do this query right here. Where region is equal to Ontario. 
So this one is saying, it says, give me everybody where the region is equal to Ontario. And that, that's not saying like, oh, it contains Ontario. It has to be equal exactly to Ontario, just like an if statement in Java where you go variable equals two equals or three equals, depending, two equals Ontario. It's the same idea, but you will notice how many equal signs do we have? Unos. Just the one. Why? Because that's what it is. There is no such thing as double equals in SQL. So where the region is equal to Ontario. Um, this is a one spot where I point out that MySQL is extra special because it's not case sensitive. Postgres is case sensitive. Teradata is case sensitive. Oracle may or may not be case sensitive depending on what options they've turned on when they paid for it. Microsoft SQL Server depends, are you ready for this one? What language it was installed in. It depends what code page the OS is on. Fun times. So it may or may not be case sensitive. And what's really weird, it's only case sensitive when it's installed on a language that has no case. So it's not case sensitive when it's installed in English. It's not case sensitive if installed in French. It's case sensitive when it's installed in Cyrillic. It's case sensitive when it's installed in Chinese. Why? Well, make a case insensitive for languages that don't have a case. Anyways, whatever. I'm okay with it. It's just MySQL, on the other hand, is case insensitive unless you force it to be case sensitive. And it's actually really interesting. It's kind of painful to force it to be case sensitive. Uh, you got to do some weird things to it. So strings are not case sensitive in MySQL. But just as out of good habit, you should assume that it is case sensitive so that you develop good habits. You know. So this allows me to do region equal Ontario, and it matches it. So when I say it's equal to Ontario, if I put in just ON, it's not going to work because it's not. It's trying to match the whole string. So it says where the region is equal exactly to Ontario. And um, yeah, you'll notice in here it says plain non-directional quotes, not the slanted ones. For you, those of you that wonder what I've talked that they're talking about. Above your tab key, below the tilde, you will notice there's something called the back tick. So you got the escape key, you got the tab key, you got that, that key right to the left of the one. And depending on your keyboard, it has two, four, six characters on it. That's the back tick. That's known as the slanted quote mark. And you cannot use Microsoft Smart Quotes either. You know the funny ones that Word, when you put in a quote in Word, just magically puts in quotes for you? Those don't work just so you know. So here are operators that we have. Um, equal. Um, we have the diamond operator. So you guys are so blessed that you can now use the not equal you're used to using in Java. Not equal showed up to the party, I think about 10, 12 years ago. Before that, we used what we call the diamond operator. So less than, greater than. Because you know what? It's impossible for a value to be greater than and less than something else at the same time. It's impossible. Therefore, it's not equal. Mind blown. Uh, less than, greater than, less than, equal to, greater than, equal to. I mean, this, those, those you've seen, they're the same as you get in Java. Um, however, now the next ones we have are a little different. We have in and not in, and I'll be demonstrating almost all of these. Um, so in is if you feed it a list of possible values. So you can just go in one, two, three, four, and it'll match anything that has one, two, three, four. Uh, not in means give me everything but this list. Um, I'll actually demonstrate some of these before I keep going with the rest. Because um, it'll work a lot better if I just show you. All right. So we have region equal Ontario. Cool. Um, let me go change this to Customer ID less than 10. And I guess I should include the customer ID just to, you know, prove that I'm not out to lunch. So if we look at this, it returned nine rows because it's less than 10, does not include 10. 
And we have the good old less than and equal to. There, now we're returning 10 rows. So this is very similar to what you guys do in an if statement in Java. So it's not that weird. When it, where it starts getting pretty special is when we start doing things like the in statement. We can do in this list. So if you happen to know that you have very specific things you're trying to find, like specific strings, specific IDs, specific something, you can put it in a list. And this allows you to match that specific list. And the other one I had in here was not in. So this is going to give me everything but Ontario and Alberta. And let's um, remember earlier I was talking about how you can um, read it almost like an English sense. How about this? Select the distinct values of city and region from customers where region is not in Ontario and Alberta. Like that's literally how you would read that. And it reads like a sentence. If it makes sense, it's probably a good SQL statement now. Is your syntax right? Who knows? Is it going to do exactly what you want? Maybe your sentence is not, you're not asking the question the right way. But it was written to be very understandable. Um, compared to, you know, C-like languages where you got these wonderful if statements and the, you know, whatever. Um, this is a lot easier to read. It's just learning the syntax. Now, the next one after in and not in is between and not between. So I'm going to go and put in customer underscore ID. And I'm going to go so give me customer ID city and region for customers where the customer ID is between 2 and 11. And I run it. And it gives me everything between 2 and 11. The between statement includes the end markers. So when you do a between, it includes the first and the last value. So it's basically doing, you know, uh, greater than or equal to, or in less than and equal to. Um, the not between, on the other hand, will give you everything outside that range. And it, it this is also one that tricks people a little bit. It excludes your end markers. You'll notice that it does not include two or 11. Because it's saying anything that's not between 2 and 11, therefore that would exclude 2 and 11 because between includes 2 and 11, right? So if it's included in between and you do a not between, it's going to exclude everything in that range. Some people will say, well, what's, what's that useful for? It's really useful for dates. You want to know everything from July 1st to July 12th. You can go between July 1st to July 12th. You want to know everything that happened except for those days, not between those days. Magic. Um, again, if you're going to write this in Java, excluding the part where we're retrieving the records, it would probably be about 10 lines of code to do this. Because you'd have the loop, you'd have the if statement, and then you'd have whatever you're doing in there. You'd have the closing curlies. You'd have a lot of code to do what you can do in four or five words in SQL. Let the database server do the work for you. That's all I'm trying to get to. Um, now, I am going to talk about the multiple clause item. So I'm going to talk about that right now. Uh, so I showed you guys between 2 and 11. When I went through school a few years ago, we didn't have the between operator. I learned I learned SQL on Oracle 7. Right around like Oracle 14 now. It's been a few years. We didn't have the between operator. We also have we didn't have the not equal to, just saying. So if I wanted to do this query the old way, we'd write it like this. And for some people, you have to understand this better than the between. It just depends on how your brain is wired. Some people will understand this. If I run this, it'll give me the exact same result. 
And the SQL optimizer essentially does that when you type in the word between, the optimizer actually converts it to this on the inside. Just like you know your Java compiler does all kinds of magic stuff to your code before it runs it, the SQL optimizer does the same thing. Is there one that's faster than the other? I couldn't tell you. Most database engines are so efficient that you can't tell the difference. Now, this is the other one where uh, people get tripped up a little bit. I used an OR. You will notice that it returned 500 rows. People get tripped up with OR. So, and, so for those of you that are curious, AND is equivalent to in Java, right? So this is what you do in Java, and the OR would be equivalent to that. And you can do the parentheses and everything just like in your if statements you're used to seeing. Now, can somebody tell me why this returned all the rows instead of a subset of the rows? Anyone want to take a guess? Or equal to 11. So anything that's greater than two will be included. Anything less than 11 will be included. That means one is less than 11. 500 is more than two. So remember earlier when I was talking about how some people, you know, you'll write a perfectly valid SQL statement, but it's not doing what you want it to do. It's stuff like this that trip people up. You just have to realize sometimes where um, you'll read a request from a from a customer or from the programming, you know, your programming spec, and it says, I want to know everybody who have accounts that live in Ontario and Alberta. So the human brain, we will say that, right? We want everybody in Ontario and Alberta. So they'll go, how many rows am I going to get back? None. Can somebody tell me what the logic is why we're getting nothing back? It should have been an or, but you know why? You can't be in two places at once. Therefore, a record is in Ontario or in Alberta, but as humans, we will read it. Give me everybody who is in Ontario and Alberta because our brains, or let me rephrase that, native English speakers, you know, depending what your native language is like, you may have slightly different syntactical understanding. So you may have, you might understand it's an or right off the bat. Because, you know, different languages handle the phrasing differently. But if it's given to you in English, they'll say, give me everybody in Ontario and Alberta. What they really mean is or. So if your query is not returning what you expect it to return, you probably have an and or situation issue. That's all. Uh, I like highlighting it this early into the course because lab 10 starts, you know, asking you questions to figure out how to do things. Okay, so I've shown pretty much this whole range down to here. Um, the next one's going to be like and not like. We will see in a minute. Okay, here's the in I did. There's the not in I did. Uh, I showed you guys this. I'm just skipping through the slides because I'd rather just demonstrate than just read the slide. Uh, but these are sample examples that you could run in the same data set. Uh, here's between, not between. Okay. So the next one I want to talk about, because I'm keeping like for last, is um, null and true. So we have one operator. And uh, let me just uh, retrieve... Uh, Actually, I'm not sure if everything I need for this, customers. Now here I am saying don't use star, but I'm using it anyways. Um, did I give myself the right data to show this? Nope. Okay. So I'm just going to change databases really quick. By the way, this is the database for lab 10, 11, and 12. So, um, okay. Yep. 
you'll notice this operator says where the whatever the heck that is, ICAO is null. It's not equal to null, it's where it is is null. Why is it is and not equal? Yeah, well, no, not necessarily. It's because database ser database servers is one of the few computing environments that expects what a null actually is. In Java, you can go, is it equal or not equal to null? And it's actually doing a little bit of magic in there trying to figure out if something is actually null or not. In the database server, when they were writing the code, like designing SQL originally, they said, you know, people should actually deal with nulls the way they actually are. Something is null or it is not null. It's impossible to be equal to null because null is the absence of value. So how can you be equal to the absence of value? You can't. It's impossible to be equal or not equal to absence of value. Same difference, right? Not equal to null because there's no value to compare to. It's impossible to compare to a null. So they came up with an operator called is. Is null or you can go is not null. Mentally, this is a lot easier to understand whether or not something is equal to null or not equal to null because there's no such thing as being equal to null. Either it is or it is not. It's very Yoda. Um, and this applies to Booleans. I don't have a database with the Booleans set up. Um, but same thing with a Boolean. It either is true, it is not true, it is false or it is not false. You can skin that whichever way you choose to. It's kind of stupid saying where is not false. It's like a double negative, but you know. Um, the reason why we can still apply it to Booleans and say it is true is not true because a Boolean in database can be null. A Boolean can actually have three states. So you could say, give me everything that is not false. That would include true and null. So Booleans are a little special that way. That's what this slide was showing about where is null or is true or is not null or is not true. You're just trying to handle that tri-state Boolean where a Boolean actually has three different states instead of just being one. Or, you know, if you're working in MySQL, there is no Boolean. You have zero and then, you know, nine versions of yes. So you end up having to use an equal sign for MySQL. Okay. Now, the like statement. I need some coffee for this one. The like operator is for pattern matching. It is a surprisingly powerful predicate or operator. It allows you to match strings and you have two different wildcard characters. Even though you only got two wildcard characters, uh, you can actually mix match them and do some really powerful stuff with it. Um, so you have the underscore, which says it must have one character. It can be any character, but there must be something there. And you got the percent sign, which says zero or more characters from this point or before this point, depending on what you try to do. So, let me demonstrate. It'll make a lot more sense once I start showing you guys what it does. So select star from customers. And here's our table. So I could go where name like So this is going to say, give me everybody whose name starts with Kirsten. It doesn't care what's after Kirsten. It doesn't care anything else after, because it says it has to be Kirsten zero or more times. What's interesting with the percent sign, a lot of people don't really put this in. Even though Kirsten Moore is the entire string, because the percent sign says zero or more characters from here on out. It's going to match Kirsten Moore, even though there's nothing else after the word, the name Moore, because that's zero or more. 
I could say just give me everything that starts with K. Cool. Uh, if I wanted to, I can turn around and say give me everything that ends in E. So it looks at the entire string and anything that ends in E. So it's zero or more characters until it hits an E. And since that's the end of the string, E must be the last character. It's pretty straightforward. I want everything that starts with K ends in E. So now we got Kirsten, Karen, Keaton, Kevin, and they all end in E. So we're matching all of that in there. Um, you know, that's kind of one of the things you could do with this. If I wanted to match a specific postal code, so I can turn and go postal. Oh, come on. Postal. Um, K percent sign. So I want to know all the Eastern Ontario postal codes. There it is. Actually, K is not going to be a good one for me. Fantastic. So here we have tons of different postal codes, and some of them actually match similarly. So let's say I want to know everything that is A something W. That's the underscore that says there must be one character. It could be anything. And now we got A7W, A8W, A0W. You can see you can start playing with the pattern matching and actually get pretty fancy with it. Uh, if you want to go past this, then you're doing something called regular expressions. Uh, I am not going to teach you guys regular expressions because regular expressions could be an entire course. It's that surprisingly powerful. And, you know, you can do a repeating group of letters, that kind of stuff with regular, regular expressions. But for a lot of searches, the like statement's more than adequate because it allows you to, you know, you can start with this, ends with that. Uh, you can mix match to your heart's content with this. Um, let's say I want to find all the uh, toll-free numbers. So in the phone, you'll notice here there's an eight. 8.5, so that's a toll-free number. I want to find all the toll-free numbers. So I could go phone Oh, I got to get have my percent signs in here. And if we look at our phone numbers, uh, it almost worked. You'll notice that 885 got picked up, 888 got picked up, but we also happened to pick up some 882s, 881, because this says, give me anything that's a dash, followed by two eights, anything, and another dash. And it just so happens that this one and this one, the double eight followed by anything happens to be the um, the exchange number instead of the area code. So then you have to think about what your data looks like, you know, that kind of stuff. So in theory, if you want to be a lot more precise, there's a few ways you could do it. You could say anything that starts with one, fantastic. Uh, but what happens if you don't know for a fact that there's always a, so we want to do anything 888. So now we're back to that whole problem where we don't know if, look at, look at these guys, they don't have a dash. They got parentheses. So we're like, hmm, something's not so great. So we want to know what these are. So we could go and that will give me all my area codes. So here's what this is doing. It's saying, ignore Anything until you see an 88, there must be another character. There'll be a dash, some under some underscores, a dash, more underscores. And the underscores mean one character at each of these places. So in theory, we could actually handle the parentheses like this. And that will give me all the toll free, regardless how it's formatted in this database. Simply by saying, give me anything 
followed by two eights and something, followed by anything until you see the pattern of three dash four anythings, and it has to end after the four things. It sounds complicated until you just think about what the data looks like and you look at the pattern, you're like, that's not that bad. You just have to work your way through. Like you saw, like I didn't get it right on the first try, right? I, I added and I added and I go, okay, well, that's not quite right. So let's modify this a little bit. That's not quite right. So now we're going to go, oh, but we know for a fact that there's always going to be three digits dash four digits. That's how all the phone numbers end in the database. Therefore, we can make sure that that's always going to end with that set. So that means any eight eights we have before it will be the toll free. It's just, you know, logic. You think about it as you work your way through it. And it's not, you're not going to get the answer on the first try. I haven't done this example since last semester. And I forgot how to do it. So I was doing it with you guys as I worked through it. Okay, so that is like. And like you saw, like like you saw, um, it's surprisingly flexible. You can do a lot of things with it, but you have to really think about what the data looks like. You have to think about the structure of the data, what the data contains, and then you work from there. And I bet you there's like four slides with examples, but you know that example on the screen was way better. So this is you know where anybody's na name starts with DA and AN in the middle. Here's our postal code example that I just did. Um, oh, here's the is null, not null. I showed you guys that already. Okay. So this slide deck is kind of interesting because it has a bunch of examples in it, but I prefer to just do them interactively instead of just reading off the slides. So this slide is a slide that none of the other profs have. Why? Because I work with database for a living. And this is a really important topic that is never taught properly. Using dates in an SQL where clause. So dates in SQL are treated, there's a typo in here, you'd think I'd fix it after all these years, uh, are treated like strings, but not quite. So when you want to retrieve data that has dates in it, you quote the date. But the thing that's happening is when you're working against a date field, the SQL interpreter actually interprets the string as a date and it actually converts it into something else in memory. So dates are easy. Timestamps or date time is not as easy. Dates are easy. Give me everything March 7th, 1975. That's a pretty straightforward statement. Give me everything on that day. The issue is when you track things with date time. And if you guys remember before the break, I talked about using date time versus just dates. You always want to use date time whenever possible because you can strip off the time, but you can't invent the time later if you didn't store it in the first place. So a common record that you will see in a database is a timestamp for things. And the catch is, actually, I'm going to go demonstrate this. Select star from orders. And you will see that my orders has an order date and it has a timestamp in it. All right, so I picked the timestamp that's on the very first row for everybody's enjoyment. And I'm going to run my statement. And I get nothing. Why do I get nothing? Nope. You can't use like against a, da a date. It will work, but it's not going to work. It'll take the date, convert it to a string, and compare that. It's not guaranteed to work. Like in this case, it'll probably work. Nope. Yeah, so if I go, sure, yeah, we can do like with the percent. Yeah, yeah, I know, over here. Yeah, so what's happening is it's converting the date to a string and comparing it as a string. 
which may or may not be accurate, depending on what. So, for example, this works in MySQL. This will not work in Oracle. What's wrong with you guys today? There's a second one to drop a shit. So that will not work in all database engines. So don't trust like because it's not guaranteed to work everywhere. I go, I know for a fact that this does not work in Postgres. At least it did not as of Postgres 14. If it if it hasn't worked in Postgres in 17 years, it's probably not gonna, they're not probably not gonna fix it. Quote unquote fix it by breaking it. So the reason why Really? No. Too late now. I can't bring it back. Uh, orders where order date is equal to 22, no, 2022-0415. And if anybody ever wonders why I insist having a numeric keypad, <laughs> there it is. Um, so the reason why this does not work is when you query against a timestamp field, what it does is if you don't include the time, it assumes hour zero. In other words, dead midnight of that date. And of course I have no records for that date. So often when you need to grab a range of records, you'll end up using, let's go, actually, let's go with, with. Uh, there's a few ways of doing it. Rarely do you actually query for a specific day, but I could go 2022-04-16. Uh, which seems like a really strange choice, but that will work because it's all greater than zero and less than 23, 59, 59, 99, 99, 99. That's what it's doing. So that's one way of taking care of looking for something on a specific date. It's not the nicest way to do it, but it is one way because rarely do you ever retrieve records for just one day. Normally, when you're running a report, you're running for over multiple days anyway. So this would be fine. As long as you remember that this would literally go. As long as you remember that's what it's actually doing, you're cool. Um, there is one other way of doing it which is um, significantly more graceful. And I'm pretty sure it's in the slides. Um, so you have two choices, because I already explained, you know, the whole defaults to zero. You can specify a start and end date time, so you could actually include the time, so 000 to 23, whatever. Or you can cast the field to a pure date. So. Here's an example of it pulling for a specific date. We can choose to cast it. Casting is something you guys are going to learn in Java. I don't know if you've already learned about casting. They've covered casting. Oh, praise. Normally, they don't cover till like another week from now. So at some point, they used to push it back because they must have brought it up because I complained. So you guys understand the concept of casting. You take one data type, convert it to a different data type. So the graceful way of handling something like this, if you know you're only working with a date, you can go. You can cast it as a date. And it's easy to read. It's not weird. Or at least it's not weird like it is in, you know, Python or PHP. I don't really know what casting looks like in Java. I've never written a line of Java in my life. I know that's not true. I wrote Java when it was Java 1.1. 1 .1. It was the last time I touched Java. For those of you that are curious, that's 1998. <laughs> so that's the last time, the first and the last time I ever touched Java was 1998. Um, so it's been a few years since I looked, it doesn't look anything like it does now. Um, but this is how you cast and you can do all kinds of cool tricks with casting. You can cast an integer as a string. 
cast a string as an integer, which sounds like kind of something you don't want to do, but theoretically you might want to do that. Uh, that way you can avoid having to worry about the time because then you can say, for this query, treat the order date as a date instead of a timestamp. And then you can just do a search just like this. Uh, it's a cool trick. Uh, it's not just a trick, it's like really useful. Um, especially if you just want to know a range of dates and you don't care about the hours, you can cast it, then use a between, that kind of thing. <clears throat> okay, now we're going to talk about numbers. Um, so far, you guys have seen strings, you've seen dates that look like strings, but they're not really strings. You also have um, numbers, because, you know, what computer type work would not be complete without numbers? And I uh, got to remind myself what the column is and its total. You'll notice I did not put quote marks on my number. Or, you know, float. Now, some people, the, the cool thing is, is that this will work if you quote it. It's not considered a best practice. So, you guys know about casting. Have you ever heard the phrase data coercion? There's a phrase you've never heard yet. What is happening here is known as a coercion. You are forcing it to be something it is not. That's what coercion means. You know, you're forcing the situation. So, what's happening is going where the total is greater than string 198 cents. But the total, the database server says, wait a second, but that's a numeric field. What am I going to do with the string? Okay, we're going to try to convert the string into an integer or into a number. So then it goes, position one, is it a number? Yes. Position two, is it a number? Yes. Position three, is it a number or a period? Yes, until it reaches the end and then it converts it into, an uh, into the numeric and then it does the comparison. How many extra CPU cycles did you just cause that poor database server? Now, of course, like I said, on a machine by yourself with a thousand, ten thousand rows, it's nothing. Got you know, you're writing a nap for the bank, and there's you know ten thousand people hitting that poor database every second. Coercion adds. Well, let's think about it. Is it a number? No, it's not. Check position one. Check position. How long? How many num? How many letters are in this string? There's all this extra loops that the code has to do to make itself behave better as opposed to is this a number yes good let's go um and the other thing is, is if you start quoting this and you have a point here my skills really really stupid and i don't actually know what this is trying to do i'll be completely honest and the correct answer is, is that it returned almost everything because it looked for anything that starts with A. And it took the A and converted it to a number. Uh, yeah, 34, if I remember right. Not 100% sure. Hang on. No, that's a quote. No, that's a... Uh... I'd have to pull up the ASCII chart. I don't remember it off the top of my head. It's been years since I've had to type in ASCII codes. I mean, I could tell you what the uh, good old, uh, you know, you want to find some interesting letters, they're all there. But it's literally converting the A into a number, slapping it in at the front of that, and it's finding anything greater than that. It's just weird. Um, it wouldn't have found anything that actually, if I scroll this by total, like, that makes absolutely no sense. Why is it finding that? So, on the other hand, if I were suddenly going to turn this around, and take that out. That way you know for a fact you're not going to have those tens in there. Second I threw a letter in there, that comparison tool just failed. Now, fun fact. If I did this in Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server, or Postgres, it would have told me I'm an idiot. It wouldn't even have allowed you to run it. It would have said, hey, you're trying to compare a string to an integer or to a numeric. That doesn't work. you got to cast your data. Then you try to cast something to a numeric that has a letter, and it's going to go, bruh. 
there's a letter in there. I can't convert that. Then it gives you another error. MySQL is really um, sloppy, very forgiving. And by being very forgiving, it allows you to shoot yourself in the foot. Because as you saw, I threw a letter in the middle of my number string and it ran it. And it goes, oh, okay, I think you want anything bigger than, actually, out of curiosity, So it gave me basically anything bigger than zero because A is bigger than zero. Why? I don't know. Just MySQL things. So be aware when you're working with MySQL that, or actually I should say with any other database server, if you're going to work with a number, treat it as a number. Don't treat it as a string. You're not going to coerce the data. You're not going to upset the database by trying to feed it something it doesn't want. And it'll perform better and less likely to cause bugs. Um, now, we actually talked about pulling column names already. I don't need to do that one. Um, so what's kind of cool though is I can go select uh, cost comma quantity from order lines. Um, You will notice that I'm querying against total, filtering for total, um, even though I'm not including it in the select statement at the top. You can include anything you want in the where clause, even if it's not included in the columns you're trying to pull back. Um, that's just, you know, you use whatever you need, wherever, wherever you need it to be. Um, and I'm going to actually lead to something else kind of nifty in a minute that's not in the slides. Um, but I just want to make sure you guys understood that. So I am going to actually show you guys that. I'll show you guys this because we're almost finished. For those of you that were curious, yes, you can do math. Uh, SQL is the world's stupidest calculator. But you can do math. And actually, people would say, well, why would you need to do that? It's sometimes, you know, your numbers may not match on one side to the other because, you know, there's a screw up somewhere, whatever. You can actually use that to do some comparisons. Um, where you can actually go cost times quantity uh, not equal to the total. And it just so happens in this case that they actually add up. So that was a bad example. But you can do some math. Uh, which leads me back to that whole date thing where, you know, do the date as a string. Because it's not a string. So what did it do? It did the math. So what will happen is sometimes you'll get somebody go select star from orders where order date is equal to this. Cool. Didn't blow up. But what it's actually saying is where the order date is equal to 2022 minus 04 minus 15. Because it's doing the math. It's a mathematic expression. It's going to do the math for you. And for those of you that are curious, yes, you can do your homework. Uh, I divided by uh, four. four. I have no idea what this is going to be. There, 20. Oh, that's kind of cool. I picked totally random numbers and end up with a perfectly round number. You can do math and it'll do the exact same thing your calculator would. Um, and this actually has, you know, some of the typical things like floor, ceiling, all the normal math stuff you'd expect. Uh, you can do math. Uh, some database servers have really good math functions. Like you can actually do, you know, do your sines and your cosines and all that fun stuff. You can do exponents uh, to the power of three. Or I could turn that around and go uh, two to the power of three times four, which still ends up being 16. 
interesting. Uh, whatever this happens to be doing, somebody can figure it out on paper. I don't care. Hard enough to try to figure it out. Well, you can do math. Um, which leads me basically to the last, one of the last items for today, aliases. So an alias allows you to rename a, a column. So I'm going to go and pull out name and postal zip from customers. Cool. We can rename these. And let's say we want to actually have this as a proper report. And now we have nicely named columns. Now from some of you might be thinking, well, why would you want to do this? Later on, when I teach you guys about joins and subqueries and that kind of stuff, you can also rename the tables. So when you do this, your whatever you rename is known as an alias, you're giving it an alias, another name, is only for the lifetime of the query. It's not a permanent change, it's temporary. It just, while it runs, it renames it. Congratulations. Now, this is where um, I hearken back to my, you know, database course in 1996. Gotta feel old. And we were running, we're learning on Oracle. We didn't all have laptops. We were given access via terminal to Oracle. And we had a line printer in the room with us. The prof would say, okay, for each of these steps, you will print off the results of the query, but you must make it look nice. So then we do this, it would rename it, and then we could send the output to the line printer. So you know it was always a race, right? Because we never knew whose work was going to come out of that printer. So it's like, send, get up and run and go grab the printout because that printer's going back and forth. Now, some of you might be going, well, what's the point of the story? So way back in the day, reports for managers were created using SQL. There would be a job where it would run that SQL statement at night and output it to a file, which is then sent to a line printer. The manager would not want to see you know, random column names, especially back in the day, column names could have been pretty special. They wanted nice names. So they'd go, um, I, a customer underscore ID as customer number, comma, name as customer, comma, I don't know, a region as province, because they want to understand it in whatever language they're using. So suddenly you could take that, rename them, and send them off to the printer. Often this is used when you are pulling the same column from multiple tables. There's there's times where you may have the same, like, for example, if you design your database and the primary key is always called ID, you may end up having ID in multiple tables. You may want to rename one of those IDs as something else so that it makes sense when you retrieve the data. Um, a few different things. So this is renaming database objects temporarily for lifetime of the query. It allows you some pretty interesting, you know, looking thing. Um, there you can rename a table, but I'm actually going to do that later when we're doing talking about joins and subqueries and stuff. Um, and you got some other examples. And then you got a really complicated one at the bottom uh, using a concat function. Uh, did you guys learn about concatenation yet in Java? So every database server does a concatenation slightly different. MySQL uses a function called concat, and there's also one called concatws, white space. So concatws takes every piece of the string, glues it together with a space in between, or another character of your choosing. But concat allows you to just glue everything together. So if I were to go here and say uh, customer ID, and then I want to grab um, address, comma, um, region, comma, I'm going to put in the cat here really quick here, hold on, 
concat. So this starts making sense. Region, comma, um, space, comma, postal zip from customers. When I return it, you'll notice what's the column called? It's literally called the function call, which is going to be really, really terrible for your Java developers or your PHP developers have to access that column because it's just going to be a random trash. Um, so let's just say we want to actually have this be somewhat correct. Maybe we could do this. And here we could go as, I'm going to make it look as this. And now we have a nice column that we can access without having this stupid function name showing up to the party. This is one of the big uses for an alias in the select list. It allows you to rename functions to something that's usable for a programmer. Otherwise, the way it was written before, the programmer would have to know exactly how you built that SQL statement to be able to access that piece of data. Or they'd have to do it by position. Or we want column number two. But you can't always guarantee what order the columns come in. Therefore, you know. So that's the alias. Okay, um, there's one other item. It's actually next week's slides, but I actually want to show it right now. Um, why would it do that? Okay. And uh, I just want to show it now so that you guys have it for the lab. Um, there's a clause called order by. You remember right at the first slide where I talked to all the different pieces, there's one called order by. It allows you to sort your results. So sort by name. And it does an alphabetical search. So it'll be sort, it'll be A, 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 B, A, C, all the way to the end. You'll notice that it has Abigail Bird before Abigail Christian. Because Abigail and the space both match, so it'll be the next letter and it'll sort it based on that. Uh, you can. It's based on the, uh, it basically, if you're using the install as instructed, it's going to be sorted like by the Latin alphabet. So A comes before B, zero comes before A. Um, and since my SQL is case insensitive, it doesn't differentiate between uppercase A and lowercase A. But in database servers where it's case sensitive, like Postgres, Lowercase a comes before uppercase a because in the ASCII table, lowercase a is before uppercase a. So it's, it's a, and you can modify your your sort order by saying it's descending, so it reverse sorts. Cool. Here's the other part though. I could go sort by name ascending, comma, sit. Okay, so so far this is cool, but I could actually go a city. Ascending and then by name. So what it'll do is it'll sort everything by the city first and then it'll subsort. So if I can find one where there's say there's a couple there it is. Annapolis County, one, two, three, four, sorted alphabetically. However, I could actually say sort alphabetically for Annapolis County and then reverse sort the names. You can sort whichever order you want for each of the columns, but it'll always be left to right. So city ascending first, name descending next. If you add another one, it'll be that one. So it'll subsort each set. Um, the only way to really learn how to use order by is to use order by. Play with it a little bit. It's you're not gonna break anything. Um, the other thing you will notice is I originally wrote the order by without a direction. If you don't include a direction, it assumes ascending. So smallest to biggest. Otherwise, you have to tell it you want it to go the other way. So if you want it by descending, you put in DESC. And now we're sorting by city in descending order. That's it. That's not, there's not much more to it than that. Um, so yeah. So this gives you everything you need for um lab 10 lab for week 10 so lab 7 um next week i'll be 
discussing the assignment two with you guys. Once again, everybody's favorite thing. It's group work. Just saying. Um, assignment two is basically labs six, seven, and eight, basically, with a little bit of the later ones, but they're such a minor part that you can just throw that in at the end, like just before it's due and go for it. Um, but yeah, that's the, that's it for today. We've covered, you know, what we were supposed to cover today. Um, again, lab seven is now, should be visible to you guys, I hope. And, uh, have fun with it because lab seven is fun. Lab eight is fun. Lab nine, everybody's crying in the club. <laughs> so just going to call it the way it is.